Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to Psychology of Language. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur and we are in the fourth week of this course. As you know, we are talking about word processing, word comprehension, uh, meaning uh, uh, related to words and how do we access the words from our mental representations, all of those kind of things. In the last lecture, we have talked a little bit about word meaning, uh, basically the grounded uh, uh, grounding problem and the embodied semantics approach. We saw some experiments that seem to give us a better idea of how the embodied semantics uh, you know, approach really works. It tells us that uh, you know, uh, we are probably storing meaning in a system that is outside of this linguistic system. So, in, we are probably storing meaning by virtue of perceptual, uh, you know, sensory perceptual representations, action based representations that is. So, that is one part we did in the last lecture. We also talked a little bit about we also talked a little bit about uh, you know models of lexical access. Now again just to give you a, a bit of a revision, what is lexical access? Lexical access is accessing the words form uh, in your mental uh, you know conceptual store and you access this words form uh, in a sense that uh, depending upon the kind of input that is building in whether it is a visual input or whether it is auditory input. So, suppose you are hearing somebody say something uh, that is also some source of evidence. So, that evidence you are kind of you know evaluating in an incremental sort of a way. So, say for example, somebody said cat, you are uh, you know listening to that in, in incrementally in, you know, in an incremental fashion. So, k, eight, uh, all of that. So, first the k sound and the a sound and the t sound and unless the entire evidence is there, uh, you will not be able to uh, you know definitively say that okay this is the word that I have heard and obviously if you know that word you can access that words form the matching form in your mental uh, you know representations and then from there go on to finding meaning and other things. This is one way uh, and the other way is uh, say for example, in, in a written kind of a modality, you have to read the words. So, the, in the written modality, obviously there is the entire word present all at the same time, but you will need to analyze that you know feature by feature, letter by letter in initial sense. Obviously, uh, you know after you know how to read uh, that becomes fairly automatic and uh, you know you will read the word anyways. Again that becomes very fast as well. We saw some paradigms looking at how lexical access is modulated we, uh, or what is the time course. We saw that this is something which is very fast uh, as early as 100 milliseconds uh, you know or say for example, if you are doing the shadowing task it can take close to around 200 to 250 milliseconds. Okay. Another thing that we did was a little bit about uh, the you know generations of models of lexical access. We, uh, we saw the first generation models of lexical access the logogen model and the frequency ordered bin search model as the FOPS model. Uh, and I think the last thing that we did was the second generation model of lexical access that was the trace model. The trace model was a visual model of lexical access. How are you taking in the visual input and how are you you know moving ahead with that majorly uh, that. Okay. So, let us continue our uh, chat about the lexical process of lexical access and we will in this in today's lecture talk to you about uh, one more model of uh, you know lexical access that belongs to the second generation and a couple of models that belong to the third generation. Okay. Let us move ahead with this. Now, we uh, the uh, let us begin talking uh, about the cohort model of lexical access. The cohort model of lexical access basically is a model of lexical access for spoken words. So, as I was saying uh, spoken input versus written input is slightly qualitatively different uh, with each from each other and also the way we react to this input shall be a little bit different uh, in both the cases. Majorly because the spoken input is something that unfolds in time incrementally. Okay. You first hear the onset, then you hear the middle part, then you hear the offset part. So, that is how the uh, you know the spoken input really works. Now, the cohort model views the process of lexical access as involving three kinds of processes. The first process is activation or contact, the second process is selection and the third process is integration. So, there are these three processes into which uh, you know uh, the uh, model of lexical access is being divided. Let us look that look at that in a bit more detail. What happens in the activation phase? Multiple word form representations are activated in response to the auditory stimulus. How is that going to happen? Suppose you are uh, you know listening a word again you know something just starting from ca. Now, there could be many things that start from ca. So, you you are not really sure. So, it could be cat, caterpillar, cap, candle, you know can, 
or any of this. So as soon as you start hearing the input in time, what happens is from the onset onwards, multiple candidates become activated. So that is how multiple word form representations will start getting activated as soon as you start with the as you as soon as you start hearing the onset of the incoming auditory stimulus. As soon as you've heard the onset of the incoming auditory stimulus, this is what will create so many representations that will all become activated and will start competing against each other. This activation is referred to as an autonomous process. So it is something that you cannot avoid. I mean, obviously you can say, for example, uh, you know, there are other processes, top down process, context, other kind of knowledge that can help you, uh, you know, uh, activate a few lesser and uh, you know uh, to uh, you know have a more di uh, goal directed activation but more often than not this is something that is autonomous and will happen uh, without any of your you know control process it is affected only by auditory stimulation as soon as auditory stimulation is there all of those things will start coming getting activated and you have to kind of sift through this multitude of uh, auditory uh, word form uh, representations that are getting activated to actually reach the final goal. So we'll see how that happens. Because multiple things are activated, it leads to the necessity for selection. So the second phase is, as uh, expected, the selection phase. What happens in the selection phase? Now sorting starts to happen uh, through the multiple word form representations to find the one that best matches the auditory input. So what happens is, say for example, multiple kinds of uh, words will start getting activated and what you will need to do is to be able to select which one matches uh, the incoming auditory stimulation in the best possible manner. Uh, remember there will be phonetic feature variations, there will be phoneme variations, there will be and, and phoneme variation will probably not happen because we are talking about the same onset. So uh, there could be phonetic feature variations and also the input as soon as the second, in, uh, second uh, part of the signal comes or the third part of the signal comes, you are getting more and more information and on the basis of this, uh, you know, fast unfolding information, you will already have, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you will already start selecting some or the others. And you know, this is the process that the pyramid, you know, starts to get inverted. Okay, so many of them activated, then very few, then very few, and then you finally reach the target word. So selection depends obviously on the bottom-up stimulus because bottom-up information is activating these word candidates. However, in case the bottom-up stimulus is not really very clear and there is some ambiguity. Uh, context fit also starts playing a little bit of a role. I think context fit um, plays a role mostly all the time because uh, say for example, uh, I, I was giving you this example of you know bat uh, uh, and uh, cricket uh, that if I were uh, having a conversation about cricket and if you are hearing ba from uh, my mouth, you are probably going to hear the ba which kind of ends with t and bat uh, you know and say suppose say for example, there is a little bit of an ambiguity that you don't heard it properly. Uh, the context also kind of zeros uh, in uh, you know uh, to that particular representation that fits the context also uh, you know particularly well. So both of these uh, things will happen. So you have activated many candidates. Now you have to select from so many candidates as to what the correct target word is. And a the unfolding input helps you. B also the context fit kind of you know uh, tries to help you in that process. And the third and the final uh, phase is the phase of integration. What really happens here is the feature of the selected words are incorporated into an evolving uh, representation of the entire utterance. What is it that you are talking about? The entirety of that utterance, okay? And the properties of the selected words syntactic and semantic uh, features are also evaluated according to the context and that all that together with whatever was happening earlier will help you zero in on the correct candidate. So in the integration phase, you're taking in much more information than just what the bottom up input was providing you. You're kind of reaching uh, something that uh, could be appropriate, is the best guess, so on and so forth. But also you will evaluate the syntactic fitness and the semantic uh, fitness of the uh, target words, of the many words that are activated to the entire utterance. And that is what will lead you to figuring in, uh, you know, or to zeroing in on the correct candidate. So, as uh, I said in the beginning, the entire uh, process of lexical access can be looked at as activation, selection, and then this integration. All right. So, uh, moving further, how does this really work out? So, results from a continuous evaluation of uh, similarity between the auditory stimulus and the word, stored word form representations, this is how lexical access really works with. Okay, it is, as I said, highly incremental, word form representations will anyway start getting activated 
as soon as you first hear the input, then this is how this will kind of move further. What is this cohort? So somebody asked me about uh, how does this, uh, why is this model uh, named a cohort? Uh, cohort is basically all of those uh, word form representations that were activated in the first phase. Okay, so 30, 40, 50 word candidates that are all activated, this entire set is referred to as the cohort. And this activation basically builds up in the initial 100 to 150 milliseconds of you hearing the auditory stimulation. Alright, so with the activation phase, all words that match the perceived acoustic profile are activated within 100 to 150 milliseconds of the word onset. This set of activated uh, candidates is referred to as the cohort. Continuous and then what happens is you are continuously evaluating as the signal is unfolding in time and these uh, representations you are kind of matching each of these representations to the signal that is unfolding in time and you are kind of uh, you know eliminating so many things and uh, you know uh, zeroing in on something here. As you said in the integration you are also considering the syntactic and the semantic fitness. All of that kind of leads you to uh, keep on going with it till the target word is uh, selected and everything else is eliminated. That is how lexical access is happening here. Now the cohort model says that the word recognition basically, uh, a successful word recognition basically depends on reducing the set of activated words in the cohort to just one that matches the in correct incoming representation. This uh, point where you, you have uh, eliminated all the other possible uh, competing representations and you have zeroed in on the correct target word is referred to as the recognition point. So in this unfolding stimulus in time, what is the point that you will know that okay, after this there are no more candidates available, this is certainly this particular word. Okay. Suppose say for example you are talking about the word trespass. Now trespass basically uh, when you start with tre, you can be talking about tread, you can be talking about uh, trespassing and so many other things. But as soon as you reach tresp, uh, this is where you kind of know that okay, there is no other word uh, that uh, has tresp and uh, can kind of uh, move into a different direction. So this, the sp point here is referred to as the recognition point where you are very sure of okay, this is the word that I am hearing. Okay, so then uh, basically what happens is the word recognition, the process of successful word recognition according to the cohort model uh, is then sort of contingent on two factors. What are the two factors? First is positive evidence for the presence of the word, the incoming stimulus and the second is the input has to rule out the presence of other words. There should be nothing else that is activated at that point in time. Both of these processes converge at a point in time when you are hearing the signal that is what is referred to as the recognition point. Okay. Now is there any evidence for the cohort model? Yes, there is. There are a lot of experiments that people have done. We will discuss a couple of them here. Uh, one of them uh, that I am going to talk about is a cross modal priming experiment. Uh, what was there was that they uh, wanted to use these auditory primes were uh, to be presented on the headphone and the participant had to take a decision about something that was presented visually. So the primes were captain and captive and the visual probes were uh, could be presented at an early time or a late time and what were the probes? The target words were semantically related to one of the two. Say for example the uh, word ship or the word guard will be presented. Okay. Now if you can see captain is related to ship, captive is related to guard. So that is the game here. Now what happens is if the visual probes are presented early, both ship and guard were found to be activated because at the point of cap, you don't at least at the point of capped, you don't really know whether uh, I'm talking about a captain or a captive. So if the visual probes are presented at that point in time where I'm reaching capped, then both of them have an equal chance of being related to this one. So both of them uh, receive equal amount of priming. However, if uh, the visual probe is presented later, after the entire word is there, then only ship gets uh, primed if captain is the word or only guard gets primed if captive is the word. That is exactly what happened here. So it tells you that there is certainly uh, something like the recognition point where the person is sure of what is really happening here. Okay. Now if you see, this is basically these were two of the second generation lexical access uh, models, the trace model that we talked about in the last section of the previous class and the cohort model that we just talked about today. Okay. So uh, let us compare them a little bit uh, just for uh, zooming in a little bit into how they function. 
So, if you look at, at the trace model, uh, more activated word candidates in the trace model meant less activation by any of these. So, basically what happens is in the trace model, if there are 20 words activated, it basically means that the activation is evenly distributed amongst uh, each of these or even if it is not evenly distributed, it basically means less activation for uh, each of them because the activation is shared. In the cohort model, what happens is because uh, the input is anyways unfolding in time, multiple activated uh, candidates actually do, does not really diminish the activation of any one of them and all word, all word candidates are sort of activated to equal degrees. Okay. What also it happens is the number of word uh, candidates that are active does not have any effect on the reaction time. Whereas the in the trace model, the number of word candidates that are uh, that are active at any point in time will have some consequence, some kind of slowing down for the reaction time for the target word. So this is something which is important, and this kind of uh, has been shown that in the non-word judgment uh, reaction time task, the cohort model gets uh, does not get affected by the number of possible uh, competing candidates whereas the trace model does get affected by the number of possible competing candidates so that is that is one thing moving on according to the trace model word form representations are matched on global uh, similarity so a slight mismatch at the beginning or the end should not really matter because you will have the entire word at the same time a word is not an unfolding signal in time as long as it is visual However, in the cohort model, that is basically uh, the signal is unfolding in time. So, if there is a slight mismatch in the beginning, you can lead to a very different word. Okay? If there is a slight mismatch in the middle versus if there is a slight mismatch in the end, the amount of uh, disruption would probably be lesser. So, what happened in the uh, cohort model, uh, that onset mismatches were more disruptive, were found to be more disruptive as compared to the uh, middle or the end, uh, offset mismatches. However, in later experiments, they have uh, basically, uh, I'll talk about that in later experiment, uh, they have kind of uh, tried to see if offset uh, matches are also uh, useful or not. So, we will talk about that in a separate uh, section. Now, uh, is there any evidence for uh, recognition points or is there more evidence for recognition points if I ask? Uh, they have used uh, some tasks uh, to check that. One of the tasks that they have used is the phony monitoring task. What is phony monitoring task? As the name suggests, you have to monitor for the presence of a particular phony. Okay? And uh, this basically has uh, been shown to be highly correlated with the recognition point of the words. So, how does this really go? Uh, it has been shown that recognition times are critical in detecting non-words. Suppose there is a longer word, uh, its recognition time comes later. So, you will take that much more time to reject it as a word or a non-word. Uh, if the recognition time is earlier, you can very quickly tell that whether it is a word or a non-word. So, that is the difference. So, they basically did this study and they had non-words which seemed like words, but the non-words were something like cathedral, uh, so the word was cathedruk made from cathedral. So, till the dr part, you do not really know whether it is a word or a non-word. You are still probably thinking maybe the word is cathedral and that is why you will kind of wait till the entire uh, thing finishes to really reject it. Uh, trankitude is easier to reject because the recognition point uh, comes much earlier. So, till the point you reach trank, you already know that you know the recognition point is earlier and there is no other candidate, no word there and you can kind of already quickly reject it. Okay? So, people are faster in rejecting words like trankitude which do not really mean for which the recognition time is much earlier as compared to cathedruk when the recognition time is slightly later, recognition point is slightly later. Okay? Uh, also, they found that recognition times to spoken words depend more upon uh, recognition points than on frequency. So, this is also something very interesting that this kind of uh, recognition point uh, correlates very highly with your recognition time uh, that you finally take to uh, you know say whether it is a word or a non-word. So, these two measures are probably you know talking about similar things and hence are very closely correlated. However, it has also been uh, shown that this uh, parameter of frequency is also important. We were talking about uh, in the last thing that recognition times uh, uh, correlate more closely with recognition points uh, even more than uh, frequency, but then frequency is also very important. It has been shown in a number of studies. So, they did revise the cohort model and they say that word forms can have either no activation, less activation or high activation depending upon their frequency. And this activation I am talking about is you can look at it as some sort of a residual activation. 
Suppose you read a particular novel, those, uh, the activation of all those words, uh, the activation of all the words in that novel will be at a slightly you know, higher level because you have just read that model as opposed to if you have not read that novel. Okay. So, hearing uh, something say for example can uh, you know, lead to less evidence or more evidence. So, basically if the residual activation is high, then you will need less evidence to activate that word. If the residual activation is low, you will basically need more evidence and hence more time to recognize that word. This is where frequency comes in. Suppose you are hearing something from starting from B. So, B uh, it says bell, bed, bet, etc. Depending upon the frequencies of each of these words, you will need more or higher time to actually recognize them. Okay, irrespective of their recognition time because the, the recognition uh, point here is uh, very similar for all of these. These are all small words. So, they uh, have shown that responses to high frequency targets are more affected by an auditory prime than low frequency targets. So, that is the basic thing about residual uh, activation. So, uh, what they say is uh, the outcome and the timing of uh, recognition processes will reflect the differential levels of activation of successful and unsuccessful candidates and this differential levels of activation basically depend on their frequencies. Further on, uh, cohort has suggested that acoustic phonetic features are directly connected to word level representations. Say for example, I, I keep giving this example, differences in on onset pronunciations are detected quickly by auditory lexical access system. So, the short word ham gets activated when ham is perceived and the long word hamster is activated when ham is perceived. So, ham and ham, ham it leads to hamster uh, or hamburger, uh, the shorter ham is uh, basically also, so it, the, what I am trying to say is that there is a way uh, that the auditory lexical system can distinguish between hamster and hamburger. Okay? So, this distinction is very quickly made and the system kind of latches on to the correct representations uh, rather quickly. Let us move, uh, so this was all about the second generation of uh, lexical access models. Let us move now to the third generation of these models. We will talk about two models, we will talk about Jeff Elman's simple recurrent network model and we will probably talk about, uh, yeah, we will talk about another model as well which is the uh, distributed cohort model. Okay. Uh, one of the things that is uh, uh, notable about these third generation models is that these models usually follow something referred to as parallel distributed processing approach. This was a new approach in uh, computation and uh, has a lot of caveats to it. I will talk about that in a bit. And these models were also much more mathematical in their approach. Okay. They are much more calculation based. Uh, also, uh, they use what uh, is uh, used in machine learning or neural networks called something like hidden layers and hidden layers are basically layers of processing which accumulate finally do the computation. So, there is an input layer, output layer and then the hidden layer. This is where all the processing happens. Alright, so let us look at uh, Jeff Elman's simple recurrent network model. Now, in a uh, simple recurrent network model, words are represented as a pattern of neural activity across a multi-layered network. So, basically you can imagine this as a network of neurons and these network of neurons will have differential activity to store different kinds of words. So, for example, if there is this bunch of neurons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, and there is a word, the word is represented as 10 percent activity in 1, 20 percent activity in 2, this much activity here, this much activity here. So, this particular pattern of activity will basically be the signature of this word. Same network of neurons can store a different word with slightly different levels of activity. So, this basically is the uh, one of the concepts that you have to remember. Words in the simple recurrent model are uh, stored as a pattern of neural activity across a multi-layered set of neurons, uh, you know, as uh, this structure and this uh, pattern of activity can change even though the set of neurons may or may, may not be the same. Okay, this is one. Also, uh, the simple recurrent model kind of adopts the traces three layered network. So, trace had three layers, it has uh, features, letters and words. Uh, the simple recurrent model also kind of uh, follows a similar architecture. In addition to this, uh, in addition to what trace had, the SRN basically has something called context units. What are context units? Context units are units that uh, process or uh, entertain information that is incoming uh, from the environment and this basically is stored in the hidden units. So, it basically stores the copy of the activations of the hidden units between the pre-processing cycles and basically what happens is this is supposed to stimulate the effect of context. 
Okay. So, the network would respond not just to the current state of inputs what is coming, but it also takes into account the residual differential activation that uh, basically makes up context, frequency, familiarity, uh, the environment, all of those kind of things. This is a very simple uh, idea of how the simple recurrent model looks. So, you can see output units, input units, in the middle there are these uh, hidden units and then there are the context units that are uh, basically modulating this activation in the hidden layers. This is how the model if uh, after if it runs after multiple iterations, this is the kind of semantic space it gives you. You will see broadly that it is putting together words that are similar to each other, some of them sometimes not. Say for example, it uh, at least separates about the nouns and the verbs uh, and then it uh, uh, puts together similar nouns and similar verbs together. Okay? So, this is basically the model classifying your semantic space after a number of iterations. So, let us talk about how processing really happens here. Now, what happens is this kind of network can be trained to predict upcoming words in a set of sentences on the basis of processing earlier words. Upon making errors in these predictions, uh, the connection weights throughout the network are changed to get the output more closely. So, there are certain parameters that uh, the model must be uh, banking on and those parameters have certain weights, weights you can think of as contribution to the judgment and the contribution to the judgment or the weights can be adjusted. Uh, say for example, in the first cycle, uh, something very different uh, is being, uh, you know, some very uh, remote output is uh, presented. In the second cycle slightly closer, in the third cycle slightly closer, what can be done is you can keep adjusting the weights so as uh, to, uh, you know, facilitate the model to come to the closest input to what the desired input, uh, closest output to what the desired output is. So, uh, when the model makes errors, people can connect, change these connection weights uh, throughout the network and basically to in order to get the uh, network to learn better and to reach the output more closely. Now, word identities can be uh, represented as a pattern of activation among the hidden units. Which words came basically can be represented in the pattern of activity in the hidden units. Okay. Now, what happens after multiple rounds of training? Uh, the model kind of it divides the set of incoming words into nouns and verbs. Similar representations being assigned to words close in meaning. So, that also happened if you can kind of go back and see. Uh, if you see lion, tiger, monster all come together, cat, dog, mouse come together, book, car, rock come. So, similar nouns kind of are grouped together versus, uh, you know, as compared to dissimilar nouns. Okay. Also, individual word representations were also differentially activated depending upon context. Suppose the sentence context is something, then the words that will have the highest level of activation will be those words that can fit into this context. Okay? So, context also slightly plays a role here. Now, this is the simple recurrent model. Let us move to the next model. The next model is the distributed cohort model. This one is just an improvement on the cohort model that we had talked about in the earlier uh, section. Uh, this just kind of on the basis of new and uh, further results that came in kind of adds in a few updates to the earlier model. So, it is precisely the same model. However, this model is capable of taking phonetic features as input and runs them through a hidden layer of processing units, also a set of context units. So, now this has both a context unit and a hidden layer of processing units, slightly unlike the cohort model because this is a PDP kind of model. The system uses the output of the hidden units to activate two further groups of processing units. So, it kind of activates two other kinds of units which the earlier model did not have. So, this has separate units for phonological word forms which is the phonological unit and a separate unit for uh, meaning which is the semantic unit. Now, you have a differentiation between phonological processing and semantic processing here. That is an interesting upgrade that this model had. And uh, what does this imply? It implies that auditory phonological information and semantic information are now stored separately. In the earlier model, we did not see a lot of distinction between the two. Further, the auditory information is directly and simultaneously connected to both stored phonological input and meaning. So, the input is basically not coming through one uh, set goal, it is coming uh, in a way that is uh, reaching the semantic and the phonological uh, units at the same time. Now, what happens in this model is one would be able to recognize a word when the pattern of activation in both these kind of units stabilizes to a particular output and that is what will be the recognized word. So, there has to be some kind of integration or some kind of a converging evidence that uh, seems to come from both phonological and semantic units. 
So what happens in lexical access moving slightly in more detail. Now when the onsets of uh, the words are heard both semantic and phonological units will get activated that is one. The phonological uh, activity becomes uh, coherent uh, slightly uh, with time and mutually reinforcing because the word with similar ons onsets will kind of facilitate each other and uh, as soon as you are kind of moving in time this will lead to stabilization of this activity. You know, in a similar manner that I said the inverted pyramid uh, is happening and you are know, selecting you are getting closer to the target already. Activation in the semantic space however will represent a blend of semantic patterns. So the context, the local context, the global context, the, the setting, the environment, all of that. So it basically the semantic space will represent a blend of semantic patterns as different uh, phonological representations might also share meaning. Say for example uh, cat and rat even though they are different phonological representation but they share aspects of meaning if you remember the semantic networks theory that we were talking about. So this will probably you know should take a little bit more time to stabilize as compared to phonological units. Let us take an example you know uh, take the example of two words jog and job according to DCM the coarticulation effect is managed by representing the O sound in jog uh, with a slightly different pattern as compared to the O sound in job. So jog and job are slightly different the O's are slightly different here anyways. Uh, now what will happen here is the DCM basically deals how does DCM deal with different meanings. Now what will happen is with words that could have multiple meanings like bank or bark in this case uh, it will lead to a less coherent activation in the semantic space while words with different senses like twist uh, can basically lead to a more coherent activation in the semantic in this space. So what happens is depending on whether there can be multiple meanings or whether there can be similar meanings in different senses uh, the stabilization pattern in the semantic space will be different okay and this has to at some point converge with the stabilization pattern of the phonological space and only then you will be able to finally select the target word. So DCM basically differs from the original cohort model in a few ways in that DCM places less emphasis on word beginnings as a critical element in lexical access. If you remember the cohort model heavily depended on the activation phase that is the activation from a particular kind of onset uh, whereas basically what happened in the later studies was they, they found that in some cases uh, word middle or word endings also play a sort of an important role. So what happens is uh, in this model the emphasis on the onset is slightly reduced and distributed a little bit more squarely across the onset middle and the offset. So part of the motivation for this is that some experiments uh, show that non-word primes can activate word form representations also that differ in onset. So this is basically some of the things that were taken into account. This was all from me uh, for about the lexical access models. We have talked about three generations of models of lexical access. First generation had logogen and phobes, the second generation has trace and cohort and the third generation has a uh, simple recurrent network and the distributed cohort model. I hope these were different theories about how do we actually perform the lexical access and none of them uh, in any way complete but they are different ways of looking at how this is happening in a more theoretical sort of a way and that is basically what you have to take uh, away from this dis uh, you know discussion about how lexical access really happens. Thank you for today, we will talk to you uh, uh, more about words in the next lecture.